Hi everyone, welcome to Kotlin Hyderabad's first talk of September 2020. Well, when we start learning advanced Java features, we start with the servlets, JSP, then we move on to frameworks. Back in old days, frameworks might have given good solutions, but now the core technology has itself evolved so much. Today, it has the potential to replace all the frameworks. So today's talk is all about Jakarta EE, also known as Java EE, how it's presenting present movie and its future will be before that uh, before the talk begins let me give a small intro about our speaker raja rahman raja is a principal program manager for java on azure at microsoft he has been an official technologist at arkin he is the author of the popular book is a v3 in action uh, raja has long been frequent speaker at many jigs and conferences worldwide including Java One and DevOps. As a Java One Rockstar, Rockstar Speaker Award recipient, he led the Java EE track on Java One as well. Raja is an avid uh, contributor uh, to industries general like uh, Dijon, the South Side. Also, he is the member of Jakarta EE, uh, EJB, and JMS expert groups. He implemented EJB container for Resin, open source uh, Java application server, he helps uh, helps to lead a Philadelphia Jug, and uh, he's a proud member of uh, Jakarta EE ambassador. Uh, without much, this is this is a small intro. Without much uh, ado, I'll uh, hand over to Reza for the talk. Reza, please can start the talk. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you guys joining. I think it's a weekend for you guys. It is a weekend for me also, uh, but it's uh, early in the morning, as you can see, probably from the lighting. Uh, so, as was mentioned, uh, my in my day job, my job is principal program manager for Java on Azure. I'm responsible for essentially everything that happens uh, relevant to Java developers on the Azure Microsoft Azure platform. But I'm not making this presentation actually part of my day job. Uh, so this is a weekend. I'm actually presenting this on behalf of the Jakarta e ambassadors. It's a, a group that I helped found some years ago. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the group uh, also. Uh, but what I also want to tell you is that this particular presentation is available to you. Uh, it's on. It's available on the Jakarta e Ambassadors shared resources. Uh, the objective of this talk is actually not for me uh, to make this presentation. I want to make this presentation with the aim so that you can uh, pick up this presentation and present it yourself. Right. That's actually the objective of this talk. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I want want to talk to you a little bit about Jakarta EE. Uh, what is Jakarta E precisely? Uh, it is actually the technology formerly called Java E and formerly called J2EE. Uh, it's been transitioned from the JCP, uh, where it was under the ownership of uh, Sun and Oracle for a very, very long time, to the Eclipse Foundation, where it really is uh, a shared community resource. All of the IP, trademarks, uh, everything belongs to the open source uh, foundation. And also, everything is also open source, including the TCK. It used to be the case that the TCK it was something private, and people that wanted to become Java, Jakarta E implementers or Java E implementers, uh, they needed to essentially uh, pay Oracle or some some money to run the TCK. That is uh, really no longer the case anymore either. Other than that, pretty much everything is more or less the same, right? So it's all open governance. Uh, you know, anyone can have a voice uh, if if they want to become a stakeholder. Uh, it, there's still well-defined process. There's clear IP flow, and that IP flow ultimately belongs to the Eclipse Foundation. In all cases, it's completely vendor neutral, neutral and completely uh, level playing field. And now, when when it was in in the JCP, uh, there was there was some special privileges for Oracle, and ultimately, most of the IP belonged to Oracle. So that is now completely changed. The stakeholders are mostly the same so far. Um, so this Oracle is still involved in it. Oracle is the uh, is still continues to be the, big, be the biggest contributor. Uh, there's IBM, Payara, Pivotal, and a whole bunch of other companies. Uh, but most importantly, uh, there's also all of us. Right? So uh, this new format, one of the big uh, differential is it's much easier to contribute as an individual. So, uh, and this is one of the objectives too of, of our moving this technology onto, onto the Eclipse Foundation is that so, so that all of us can uh, begin to get involved and begin to contribute in a meaningful way. So if there's one thing that you take away hopefully from the presentation today is to get involved, right? If you wanna get involved in open source, if you wanna do something outside of your day job, 
Jakarta is a really good place, <coughs> a really good project to get involved in. Uh, and certainly, the Jakarta ambassadors can help you do that as well. So if you want to find out more about Jakarta as a technology, log on onto the website. Uh, I will share this deck. As I said, the deck is also available on the Jakarta ambassadors website uh, that I'll mention later on. Uh, and uh, you can take a look at you can take a look uh, log on onto jakarta.ee, uh, the website to find out more about Jakarta e as a technology at a, at a high level. So this uh, slide is showing a little bit of the evolution uh, from JPE to J2EE to Java E5 to uh, to Jakarta to finally now Jakarta E. So this is a technology that always has been evolving for a very long time. Uh, evolving to meet the needs of uh, of, the, of the developers uh, and adding features and removing features as it makes sense. Uh, so Java E8 was the last release under uh, the JCP. Uh, the current release uh, for uh, Jakarta, the technology is Jakarta E8. So uh, Java E8 and Jakarta E8 are actually binary compatible. The same technology, same APIs, same everything. The only big difference is the governance, right? So whereas Java E8 was released by uh, the uh, JCP under closed TCK, Jakarta E8 is released by the Eclipse Foundation under open TCK. And actually under the open TCK, there's already been uh, one or two additional servers that weren't certified before that are now Jakarta E8 certified that didn't used to be uh, Java E8 certified as of yet. So the next upcoming release uh, that I'll talk a little bit about is Jakarta EE9 and Jakarta EE9.1. Uh, this release is particularly really about namespace transition. So one of the things that needed to change, because things are not under the JCP umbrella anymore, is that you can't use the name Java, uh, and you also cannot use the namespace Javax anymore, or Java or Javax. Uh, so you have to transition everything. The name, as you can see, is changed a little bit. Similarly, the, na the namespace will also need to change. So all of the technologies will be moving to the Jakarta namespace as opposed to the Javax namespace. And that is really all about what Jakarta E9 is about. And it's, it's going to be released soon. Uh, the first release candidate of Jakarta E9 is actually already out. The major feature changes. Now, once Jakarta E9 is done, that will enable uh, a lot of other changes to, to, uh, to begin to be done and the technology to really be actively evolved in a way that has not been the case for a very long time. In fact, the objective is to have a Jakarta release every year. So have a, re have a, yearly, uh, uh, have a yearly release or maybe a little bit earlier in terms of preview releases, uh, as opposed to the three or four years that has been the average for Java E as a technology at a later at the later stages. Now, very early on, very early on in its career in J2E, it used to actually be about a year or a year and a half cadence as well. And I think that was key to uh, for uh, the technology to be successful as well at the time. So I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, JPE is the original name for all of this technology. It's a uh, long past history, but just out of historical curiosity, it was called Java Professional Edition, JP. Okay. Anyway, moving forward, uh, this is Java Jakarta E8 at a glance. Again, sim same as uh, Java E8 in terms of technology compatibility. Uh, uh, the biggest difference again is is, is the mo movement to the to the open open source governance model. A lot of stuff in in Jakarta E8 actually. Uh, the reason it has uh, still a vibrant uh, technology and even relevant now is because we put a lot of effort into making it feature complete. Uh, so if you are writing mostly monolithic applications, uh, Jakarta 8 is a very, very feature complete uh, uh, feature complete technology because of all of these changes that, ha that were made. Uh, now, what I find is a lot of people actually don't know what's in Jakarta E8, uh, so I will, uh, or Java E8 for that matter. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is give a little bit of an overview and feature tour of the things that are that were in Java E8. So these can be categorized in several buckets, as you can see. So web standards alignment. So this is aligning with all of the uh, standards that, uh, are not, that are not Java standards. Uh, they are coming mostly out of the W3C. So this is things like HTTP2, uh, servers and sent events, or HTML5, uh, JSON. I don't know how many people know this, but JSON is actually a W3C specification. All of these technologies have undergone uh, a, a rapid evolution and are continuing to do that. 
And basically, one of the key objectives of Jakarta E8 uh, was to basically make sure that these uh, changes are available to server-side Java developers. CDI is another key one. So CDI was became the key component model uh, in Java E as of Java E6. Uh, since then, there really hasn't been much changes in CDI itself. So uh, in Jakarta E8, uh, we have CDI 2.0. That was the first major uh, revision after CDI 1.0. The intermediate releases were CDI 1.1 and CDI 1.2. Now, in addition, in addition to the CDI itself, um, the other thing that has been happening for a very long time is uh, all of the rest of the platform has been aligning with CDI. So some of that took place as well. So one of the big ones was JSF no longer has a managed bean uh, model of its own. That's been completely deprecated and replaced by CDI. Uh, JSF also uh, introduced the concept of injecting many different artifacts. You used to be able to look up these artifacts only, so things like the faces context. Uh, all of those things can now be injectable via CDI. Uh, similarly, in, in persistence, one of the big changes were, were uh, in JPA converters, you can now inject CDI artifacts. So you can have very, very powerful converters that may be called back in services if you want to. Simplicity has been a theme uh, for Java EE for a very long time. We worked very, very hard to simplify as many parts of the platform as possible. This has been going on since Java EE 5. Uh, and one of the biggest examples of simplicity in Jakarta 8 is security. So as you'll see in a second, because of these changes, security is actually the simplest uh, in Jakarta EE compared to any other framework or any other technology out there that you will see. Uh, the other bit of simplicity is removing unnecessary stuff. So uh, we did do a little bit of pruning of the older uh, EJB2 features from the J2E era. So I think that's a, that was a very nice thing. Uh, and the other thing that uh, Java E always does is make sure to align with interesting Java SE features. So again, a good example of that is annotations. I don't know how many of you know this, but Java E5 was the main first mainstream technology to actually adopt and prove out annotations. So similarly, uh, Java E always takes advantage of Java SE features. Uh, uh, Java SE 8 was a particularly really nice uh, release. A lot of interesting stuff like repeatable annotations, the daytime API, streams, completable features. And basically, just like it has always done, uh, Jakarta 8 adopts all of those interesting features into the platform and basically making it, uh, put, putting it into mainstream use. And we'll see an, an example of that in the later part of the presentation. So most of the presentation is going to be uh, exploring these sorts of features in detail, uh, which I'm going to be doing next. But I'm going to take a quick pause and make sure that uh, you don't have any questions. And if you have any questions, I'll address them right now. So uh, I'll, let me stop here for a second. Any questions so far? Uh, Raja, we don't have any questions as so far. OK, kind moving of forward. So feel free to stop me anytime and ask me questions. It's really not a big deal. You don't have to wait until uh, the end of the presentation for your questions. There's, there's no need. Sure. sure. OK. So one of the big changes, uh, the, the most significant change, I would say, uh, that has a ripple effect across the industry is Servlet 4. Right. So Servlet continues to be a very, very important part of the, uh, of, of the Java ecosystem in general. So the primary objective of Servlet 4 is to enable HTTP 2, right? So I don't know. Uh, uh, again, I find that a lot of people don't actually know what is an HTTP 2. So HTTP 2 was almost uh, 15 years in the making. It's the first major revision of the uh, very important HTTP protocol. The HTTP protocol is basically what the entire internet is, is running on. So what is HTTP 2.0? Um, HTTP 2.0 is actually a modernization of the uh, of the of the protocol uh, to make it relevant in today's environment. What that what exactly does that mean? So, in order to understand what that means, you need to time travel back with me, back when uh, HTTP 1.1 came out, and that was 15 years ago. Uh, so now, 15 years ago, uh, the web looked very different than it does today. Uh, 15 years ago, when there was things like uh, Initially, things like uh, uh, and Netscape, the internet looked a lot like a set of Wikipedia pages, right? So all you would see is a lot of text, uh, a lot of white backgrounds, uh, it, m a few images here and there where it is absolutely necessary to explain something, and then hyperlinks. That's about it. So 
in that world, the protocol that made really sense, <clears throat> made a lot of sense is the protocol the way it had been for so many years. So this protocol basically, whenever it encounters a need to load a page, it makes a single request to the server and loads up a single resource. Uh, and then it, if it encounters a need to uh, load something else, it makes another request. So if you have a, a, a few uh, images here and there and a few <clears throat> web pages that are mostly text, this works out just fine. Right? Yeah, somebody clicks on a hyperlink, you make another request. Um, there's only a few images on the page. You, know, you make additional requests to load up those pages as you are rendering the page. The problem is today's web, even uh, simpler, so-called simple websites, don't look like this anymore, right? So these days, when you're loading up a page, you're loading up a whole bunch of other related resources, things like CSS, JavaScript, images, videos, embedded content, so on. In fact, Google did a study uh, um, uh, a few years ago that showed uh, that the average page has about 40 different dependencies. So what this means is using the old HTTP protocol, you're making 41 different uh, resource calls and opening and closing them. So this introduces a whole bunch of inefficiencies. So the web actually is much slower than it should be because of this fundamental problem, fundamental mismatch in the, at the protocol level. So HTTP 2.0, is designed to solve this mismatch. And it does that in, in, a, in several different ways. The most important thing it does is that it introduces the notion of a longer lived connection. So instead of the, the browser making a single connection to the server, as you can see in, the, uh, in, my, in my little graphic here on the page, uh, the browser basically makes a single long lived connection between the client and the server for the duration uh, uh, that's slightly longer, or maybe. Uh, uh, rendering multiple pages, okay? And what happens is uh, it breaks down, the, the client, client and the server break down this single connection uh, into streams. So you can exchange multiple resources uh, in, in bit, little bits and pieces and, and representing multiple resources over the sing, single connection. It's an old technique. Uh, TCP basically uses exactly the same technique. Uh, in, or, in order to uh, exchange the data. So this is called request and response multiplexing. Okay, So other than that, each of these streams actually has a priority as well. Right? So that helps the browser uh, determine which uh, things should be requested and uh, first at, and at a higher rate and what should be rendered first. Uh, there's also another important technique called server push. So all of those 40 different resources, in many cases, the server knows that on the initial request that it needs to also send out all of those other dependent resources. So in HTTP 2.2, uh, in or, or in HTTP 2, 2.0, the server has the ability to say, "Hey, you are requesting this one resource, but I know you you need a bunch of other dependent resources. I'm also going to send you all of those resources all at once. You don't have to ask me for it." Okay. <clears throat> and also fundamentally, all of this uh, data interchange under the single uh, multiplex connection. That is no longer happening in ASCII. It used to happen in ASCII. Now it all happens in binary. Okay, So this actually introduces a lot of efficiency gains. So you don't need to use gzip compression anymore uh, and many other ways of trying to improve HTTP performance. This is just all binary from by default and all uh, basically over HTTPS by default as well. Um, the last bit of uh, uh, optimization that's in HTTP2 is called header compression. And what this is, it's not like what you think. It's not like gzip compression that we're talking about here. But basically what happens is when you are making these related resource requests, uh, the observation is that a lot of the headers are basically the same. Really, the only thing that changes is uh, uh, you know the content name and the content link, other than things like refer and server and all of these other headers basically remain the same. So because you now have a uh, shared connection, you can also have shared metadata. Right? So you don't have to uh, exchange so many header bits of header information. You can just exchange per resource, only change the, uh, exchange the headers that are actually changing. Okay? So because of all of these things, you should expect to see between a 6 and a 10 time performance gain when you've upgraded from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2.0. The other thing about uh, all of this is that most of these changes are hidden underneath the servlet layer. So the servlet API hasn't changed at all. All that it is doing is ensuring uh, that a servlet engine that implements servlet 4 
actually uh, actually uh, at our uh, properly implements HTTP2, that's it, right? But that's a very important characteristic as well. There's no other way of verifying that other than uh, passing the servlet spec. Um, the only API change that was made is uh, for server push. Okay, that is not possible without making some API changes on the server side. However, even that is opt-in. So if you don't want to take advantage of it, nothing changes for you. Uh, and if you're using a framework like JSF, JSF will actually hide server push under the hood, right? So JSF knows what the dependent resources are uh, because, because of the way JSF pages are defined. So uh, JSF actually takes advantage of servlet push under the scenes. So if you're using, basically, if you're using Jakarta E8 and you, you've upgraded uh, from uh, Java E7 to Jakarta E8, uh, you get all of these performance benefits essentially for free. Okay, for for most of, most of your server side web pages. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about <clears throat> uh, Jakarta JSON binding. So uh, as you know, the Java platform and Java E platform has a number of ways of doing data interchange and a number of serialization mechanisms built in. Java serialization is one. XML is another. So XML has been a part of the platform for a very long time. Nobody. Uh, actually introduces a J XML processing API with it because it's just there uh, in terms of uh, JAXB and uh, XML streaming and all of those all of those technologies. But in today's world, uh, the data interchange format that is more important is JSON. Okay, so JSON originated in the JavaScript space, but actually JSON is in general being used as a data binding and serialization and deserialization mechanism across the web very, very commonly, whether it's mobile websites or spas, JavaScript frameworks, or what have you. So it makes sense to have that first class support similar to XML and similar to Java serialization in the platform itself. So that's the objective, is like making JSON a first class citizen of the Java platform. So there was a, a lower level parsing API that was added in Java E7. It's called Java API for JSON processing. In Jakarta E8, you also have an a POJO version of this. So you can just take a, a Java object and assume that it's going to be serialized properly, uh, just because of the fact that there's a Jakarta uh, JSON binding inside in, built, built into the platform. Uh, there are some small number of annotations to allow you to customize behavior. So, so for example, you can rename a field called using the JSON property annotation or uh, mark something as transient. You know, don't serialize this particular data uh, in your JSON stream using using um, these annotations. So a few small number of annotations, but the idea is things just basically work. And it is also integrated with things like in Jakarta REST, right? So that what that means is, uh, it again, it, it, things just work. You don't have to do anything. As soon as uh, the platform detects you're using application JSON as a MIME tab, it just applies JSON, uh, JSON um, processing for you. Now, all of this was possible uh, for a little while, ever since Java E7, actually, in mo most Java E platforms. Uh, uh, you know, but they were done in a non-standard way. Right? So there were, some, there were some other proprietary API that you needed to specifically configure in order to get this working. So here's a simple example. Uh, my example is uh, basically producing an application JSON type of person. It is a Jakarta REST endpoint. Uh, so what is happening here is that we're creating the person object and returning it. And just because everything is uh, there by default in the platform, uh, it, the, what the client will ultimately see is just a, a directly a sensible representation of my person Pojo. Uh, in, in JSON. So it is really as simple as that. If you wanted to change behavior, again, you can put in some uh, annotations in your posture, but that's about it. Right? That's all you really need. Okay. So there were some changes in the uh, earlier uh, lower level API in Jakarta JSON processing as well. Now you might want to ask why this, this uh, API is useful. This API is useful when you want uh, greater control over serialization, or if you want just a small, you, you have a complex object and you only want to render a very small portion of it, right? So that makes sense to write just a few lines of uh, JSON processing code to render render that uh, render that kind of use case. Now, there were a few changes made in Jakarta EE8 uh, to this API as well. Uh, namely, this is again aligning with web standards called uh, two web standards, JSON pointer and JSON patch in particular. 
There was also some uh, changes made for to align with Java SE. In particular, you can now interoperate between uh, uh, between these uh, JSON processing arrays and streams. Right? So you can convert back and forth between them. Okay. So let's take a look at JSON pointer as an example. So what is JSON pointer? JSON pointer is basically similar to XPath, if you're familiar with XPath. So what it is, is that it, uh, it points to a particular part of a JSON uh, document using a URL-like syntax. Okay, so you see a, uh, an example of both the JSON pointer URL as well as the API in JSON processing uh, uh, on screen. So basically what this is doing is that it's saving you from writing very complex traversal and looping logic to get to that particular element. All you need to do is provide it in a very compact way and, it, and lo and behold, it will quickly take you to, to, take you to that element. It's especially useful if you have multiple types of JSON documents but they have similar URL bots. So you can apply the same JSON pointer in different places as well. But in general, it's useful. Uh, it's very useful if you're going to do any kind of traversal of, uh, of, of JSON, JSON content in a very compact way. So JSON path is patch is another important one. It's very similar to HTTP patch. If you're familiar with HTTP patch, this will look very familiar also. So JSON patch itself is a JSON document. And what that is, is it allows you to uh, apply changes to JSON documents in a declarative way, right? So there is various different, op different operations that you can specify to mutate your JSON, JSON document. So things like add, replace, remove, uh, move, uh, copy, and even test, test to see if there's an existence of, of a particular class. These are all the operations that are available to you. You can see a couple of examples. Um, I'll show you the examples uh, in, in Java code as well. Uh, again, showing you how the uh, Java API actually looks like. So as you can see, in the first case, we are doing a replace operation. So we're replacing the mobile number for Duke. And in the second case, we're removing um, uh, an element. We're removing the element Jane from an array. Uh, it's all using JSON pointer in, in the examples. And as you can see, uh, ultimately, what you get is that it's a very powerful and compact way of making changes, okay? Uh, using 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 the Java API that mirrors JSON pointer. So you can see the uh, the couple of examples that we have here. Uh, again, it's useful uh, in terms of applying these changes to multiple different types of documents uh, because everything is using the builder API. So you can build up a certain set of operations and you can apply them uh, over and over again. Okay, so SSC is another important one. Um, what is SSC? Uh, SSC is part of the HTML5 body of standards. So uh, in Java E7, uh, the, the big part of the uh, HTML5 that was applied was WebSocket. So this is something between WebSocket and, uh, and vanilla uh, REST. So in WebSocket, you're using HTTP, but really you're living in the TCP world meaning everything is bidirectional, everything is asynchronous. You can have, uh, you can initiate a, a, a request uh, for either from the client side or from the server side. <clears throat> it's useful for um, cases like um, uh, online multiplayer gaming or chat applications. Okay, those are, those are very good use cases for that. HTTP, as you know, is uh, good for transactional type of APIs, right? So, uh, REST is a very good example, you, or, or a web page is a very good example. You make a request from the, from the client, um, the server gives you a request, response back, you're basically done, that's, that's the request response cycle. <clears throat> In server sent events, uh, what happens is that the communication is unidirectional, so it's always uh, the client initiating, initiating a request, the server always making a response, but instead of getting just one response, you get multiple responses over a period of time. Right? So um, examples of these things are stock ticker applications or monitoring applications. So you wanna uh, connect to an edge endpoint, connect to a server and get updates over a period of time from a single source. So under the hood, this is all plain vanilla HTTP. There's really no big differences um, with plain vanilla HTTP. It's just long live HTTP connection parsed in a slightly different way and handled in a certain different way. The big difference is the content type, right? So the content type <coughs> is a specific content type called text slash event stream, 
right? That's how a client and server knows that they are talking about server-side events. And in fact, there's a specific JavaScript API to handle server-side events on, on the client side. On the server side, um, these changes come to you through the Jakarta REST API. Uh, in fact, this is also something that has been available since Java E7 in a proprietary way through Jersey. So in fact, the API looks very much the same as, as it was in Jersey. So if you were used to the proprietary Jersey API, um, the Jakarta uh, REST API for service and events will look very, very similar. So here's a simple example of that. Um, so I'm just taking my uh, stock ticker example. Okay. So this is let's say in the in the stock ticker example, uh, I have this uh, REST endpoint called tickers. You log on onto that making a GET request. And as you can see, the content type is text event stream, signaling that this is a uh, server sent events uh, or interaction. So as a result, you don't get a return type. You get a return type of void. Uh, but what you do in, in the API is that you get two different useful objects uh, injected into your method. One is SSE, SSE event sync, and that is representing the long-lived connection. Okay, so as you're creating new objects, you send uh, objects down this connection by invoking the send method. The other useful thing you get is SSC utility object. And what this allows you to do, as you can see in the example, uh, is basically take a POJO and very easily convert it to a stream by invoking the new event object. And you can customize the object, uh, customize the, the event more if you want. There's other metadata methods available. Uh, and typically, you would do that in a background thread, just like you're doing uh, in, in the example here. So we're taking a manage executor service, and we're using a Lambda to take uh, a bit of functionality uh, in 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 my uh, in in my code in to the to that executor and running it in the background. So here's an example of where Java EE actually uh, integrates with Java C8 quite well. Okay. So uh, those are the changes uh, largely in the web tier. Uh, so let me stop for a second and uh, let me see if anyone has any questions. Um, any questions so far? <clears throat> uh, as of now, we don't have any questions, but people are sharing their views. Uh, like uh, Goldie saying that uh, it is good to support, uh, good to see uh, a support for the manipulation of JSON, like this. So people are sharing their uh, views, and it's really good to see these uh, JSON manipulation features. All this. Yeah. Cool. Nice. All right. So let's move forward a little bit on the back end. So we talked about um, how. <clears throat> Uh, Jakarta security is one of the uh, is one of the simplification steps that was done in the Jakarta platform. So, so when I say this and and people see that it's uh, version one of Jakarta security, people immediately ask, "Hey, this is uh, almost twenty five year old technology. Why is it version one of security? So how was ja Jakarta e application secured before?" People that are not familiar with uh, Jakarta e security. So the answer is that Jakarta security, the way it was structured, is that there was bits and pieces of security in different uh, different stand, uh, different uh, specifications. So servlet had a little bit, how to secure an endpoint, uh, do you use uh, what authentication or authorization method you use, uh, what URLs to secure, those type of things. EJB had a little bit. Uh, by saying, hey, only people with this role can access this particular resource, and so on. So it was scattered in many different places. And actually, a large part of this part of the security was a very application server dependent. Right? In particular, uh, the application would describe how it was to be secured, right? Uh, but it never uh, would specify what the security bindings are, right? In other words, uh, it never you can you can never configure uh, directly in the application that I want to connect to a database to secure this application right that is always done in a vendor specific way typically through a GUI wizard right um, uh, or XML, XML external XML configuration uh, outside I said outside of the application to say hey I want to connect to a database or I want to connect to LDAP and so on so there are important use cases of that and, and there's a reason why things were done that way. The principal reason things were done that way that still makes sense is that it allows separation of responsibilities between developers and admins, right? So you as a application developer, you develop your application, and then you hand it over to the admin, and the admin is responsible for configuring things like LDAP 
connectivity and mapping, uh, you know, how a user from LDAP uh, should look like to the application, what roles and resources they would have. So for certain enter enterprise classes, class classes that still that model still makes sense. The weaknesses of that model is that um, developers don't have programmatic access to those kind of things, and also they vary from one app server to the other, right? So if you secure your application in one way in JBoss, and let's say you move to Open Liberty or Tom EE, well you not you not need to do that security in a different way using the specific techniques of that app server. So that introduces a little bit of difficulty in terms of application portability. So Jakarta security solves these particular problems in a couple of different ways. Um, first and foremost, it provides uh, uh, out of the box uh, uh, security bindings that you can use in the application itself. I'll show you those in a second. Uh, it also allows for simple pluggability where you are using an, uh, a security mechanism outside of those uh, ones that are supported by the platform. And it also takes all those bits and pieces that are in different specifications and puts them in one spot. Okay, So let's take a look at that. So this is now how you do uh, security in Java E. It's as simple as that. It's, it's just one of these annotations that you put somewhere in your application and you configure it in the way that's shown on screen and that's it. That's all you need to do in order to secure against an LDAP or secure against a, a, against a, a, a database. <laughs> now, let's assume for a second that you don't use these things and you're using some other older mechanism uh, to do security. What do you do then? Well, it becomes as there's no jazz plugin or anything else like that that you need to handle. It's as simple as you define a CDI bean with the application scope. It needs to implement the identity store interface which implements just one method called validate. And the validate method takes the credentials as an, as an argument. Typically, this is going to be just a username and password or digital certificate of some kind. Uh, and then you do whatever it is that you need to do. For example, you can inject your own custom service to do validation. And then once you do, are done the validation, you return the validation result to the runtime, typically success or failure. And in case of success, um, the name of the logged in user, uh, what groups they belong to, and so on. Right, so it's as simple as that in terms of extending security in Java E now. Uh, there's also, instead of the EJB context and serverless context uh, and different things where you can get access to the currently logged in user, there is now one uh, interface available anywhere where CDI is enabled called security context. Okay, And the security context can tell you, hey, who is the logged in user and what, what roles do they belong to? And you can use this wherever you want. You can use this in the database layer. You can use it in the business layer. You can use it in the web tier, wherever it's necessary. In fact, in my example, I'm applying it in an interceptor. So uh, once I've defined this interceptor to print out the uh, currently logged in user's name and whether they're an admin or not, uh, basically, I can apply this interceptor wherever I want in my application. Or I could ap apply it to every single uh, CTI bin if I wanted to. Uh, probably a little bit crazy to do that, but you could, but you could do it. OK, so CDI2 is another thing that has changed. Um, one of the things that has changed is actually making CDI available outside of Java EE uh, by defining a bootstrap API. So if you don't have any kind of container and you're just using a Java SE application or you're in Tomcat or Jetty, you can invoke this uh, uh, um, the set of APIs to bootstrap uh, CDI okay, outside of a Java environment. No need to do that inside of Java EE. Another important change is asynchronous events. I'll show you that in a second. Um, uh, the other key part of CDI is a portable extensions API. And this is intended for people that want to extend the platform and create their own uh, integrations. Okay, So this API uh, used to be a little bit complicated, significantly simplified in, in CDI2. Uh, and also, there was some Java SE alignment that was done in, across the CDI spec as well. Things like lambdas and repeatable annotations and so on, and completable features and so on. OK, so let me show you an example of an asynchronous event. Um, so CDI has this very simple mechanism for passing events right, bet between endpoints. So you can see an example of that. So you, you, uh, you inject a uh, type of event. You give it a payload. You invoke the fire method where you want the event fired. And you, wherever you want it observed, you simply put in the observes annotation. That, that's, it's as simple as that. 
So this used to be synchronous uh, in CDI, meaning that when you invoke this uh, method, it would be uh, in the same thread. Okay, the invocation and the obs observation would be in the same thread. Uh, in CDI 2.0, this can be asynchronous. Okay, so you can call fire async as opposed to calling fire, uh, and you can use observe async as opposed to using observes. Uh, basically, what this allows you to do is uh, fire and observe the event in an asynchronous fashion as opposed to observing it in, in a synchronous way. Okay, so adapting key Java AC innovations, as we talked about, this is an important part of the platform as well. Um, so namely, this is about uh, basically taking Java AC 8 innovations where some very important things uh, happened and actually Java AC 8 continues to be the most uh, popular uh, release uh, of Java SE, so, uh, Java SE, even with Java SE 11. We're all the way up to Java SE 13 at this point. But Java SE 8 continues to be the most popular one. Uh, so most of these innovations are actually usable in Java E as is. I, I already showed you an example of that in Lambdas earlier. So Lambdas, Daytime API, these are basically you can use them with mix and match with Java E as, as you wish pretty much because the majority of that uh, code is actually in the business logic. It doesn't actually interface with the Java E APIs per se. But there are some cases where that is not true, right? And in those cases, you actually did do want to uh, adopt those changes within the uh, technology itself, and that more or less has happened. So it has happened for repeatable annotations, it has happened for the daytime API, it's happened for completable features, and it's happened for streams. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these examples. <clears throat> repeatable annotations is uh, is a pretty simple, straightforward one. So in uh, prior to Java AC8, you could not repeat annotations, right? You could only have one annotations at a given point, like a class declaration. So as a result, Java EE, to work around that, had a bunch of these wrapper annotations, like named queries, as, a, as an example. So in Java E8 and, and uh, Jakarta E8 and Java AC8, you no longer need to do that. Right. Uh, you can just repeat annotations. You're allowed to do that. Um, and although the handling is just done for you, uh, there's a number of uh, places where this needed to take place. You know, as you can see, this is a JPA example. But basically, across the the, the uh, standard, there's J JPA, JSF, EJB, a number of places where these repeatable annotations uh, are in play. Uh, and now you can repeat them in this way. Another one is the Daytime API. So those of you who are aware, Daytime API is a much more improved version over util date. Right? So it allows for a very easy manipulation of dates. So adding days, removing days, comparing uh, dates, uh, internalization, internationalization, all of that is a lot simpler compared to the old Java util date. So let's, uh, uh, again, for the most part, you will do most of those changes in the business logic. You don't need to do anything in the and the application uh, in, in terms of Java E API interaction. But there are some cases where that is not true. So here's an example. So let's say you have an entity and you have a, uh, a, a field that is expressed as a daytime API object. In this case, I want to know when an accident happened, the instant it happened. So it used to be the case that if you did this in Java, prior to Jakarta E8, JPA would have no idea how to handle this. But that is no longer the case with Jakarta E8. Jakarta E8 will transparently handle uh, these daytime API classes just like it handles the Java util date classes as well. Right? So you can do this without worry. Same thing for JSF. If you want, if you have a JSF backing bean that uses the daytime API, that now will just work out of the box. Okay. Completable futures uh, is a bit of a complex topic, but I can express it relatively simply. So basically, completable futures are the promises of Java. If you're familiar with JavaScript promises, it's the same concept. So it allows you to do uh, invocations of uh, asynchronous uh, items in a non-blocking and composable way. Right. So Java Util Future, it's blocking. Uh, you know, callbacks, it's very complex, and you get callback hell uh, when, when you try to do any con kind of composability. So basically, what completable futures are is that it takes the best of the best for, uh, best of uh, futures, and it takes the best of callbacks and puts them together. Okay. So you see an example over here of uh, the completable future API being adopted by uh, the JAXRS client API. So client API is a good, a good example of this because you often 
if you have multiple microservices, you have to compose those microservices in a certain way. Uh, often those microservices uh, calls will have some latency, so you want to make them in an asynchronous way. So this is basically, you can take a look, close look at this, but basically all of these invocations are happening in an asynchronous way, and then we are combining them in the, in the REST invocation in, in a sensible way. Okay. All right. So streams, uh, I talked about this already. Streams are a way of doing uh, sort of group by collections operations uh, in in uh, in Java in an easy way. So some sort, max, min, all of those kind of things. Uh, and basically, what has happened is there's a couple of places where this again majority of that stuff you'll typically be doing in Java C code in business logic. But there's a couple of examples where you need uh, help from Java APIs, and you need Java APIs to actually work with Java uh, with Java ICH streams. Uh, one example that you see on screen here is that the JPA criteria, uh, JPA JPA queries can now directly return streams. You can, if you if you invoke get stream result, okay, so you can immediately get a stream, and then you can manipulate the stream result in some way, just like I'm doing here. Uh, I'm basically printing out uh, you know a, a list of the my list of results, and I'm printing out when they were published. Okay, so uh, another example I already mentioned uh, is uh, the JSON processing API, where you can convert between JSON arrays and uh, Jakarta streams in the same way. So do be cautious when you use this, right? So um, a lot of the streams operations look a lot like where clause operations and group by operations. Uh, the reality is you have to be very cautious. In many cases, the database will still outperform any Java code, so you really don't think of it as a replacement to your where clause. Okay, so use that in a uh, where by or group group by clause. So use it in a sensible way. Okay, here are some other changes. Uh, these are uh, the ones that I just mentioned are just the big ticket changes. There are many other smaller grain changes of, uh, in uh, Jakarta E8. Uh, things like uh, very easily using WebSockets in JSF. Uh, you know, the Jakarta Places CDI integrations that I already talked about, more bean validation constraints. So I showed you a one bean validation constraint here already, the at post annotation. Okay, that will also work with uh, work with daytime APIs. So that was another API that was changed, that was adapted to uh, the daytime API or Java IC8. So similarly, there are many other bean validation constraints, uh, newly added email, not empty, past, future, etc. Uh, I showed you an example of a single uh, SSC event between one, one single client and one single server. You can broadcast SSC events to multiple clients at once from a single endpoint. Uh, in addition to asynchronous C uh, events, you can now also order uh, events in an asyn asynchronous way uh, in, in CDI as well, uh, and, and so on. Right? So there's a number of uh, all of these interesting, all of these interesting features uh, that are that are there uh, in, in the platform now that you can take advantage of. Okay, so uh, there are a number of Jakarta eight implementations already. Pretty much uh, there, uh, all of it except for WebLogic is now Jakarta eight compatible. Uh, in fact, there are some new ones uh, that hasn't been there before. If you want to take a look, look, take a look at the full list of compatibility. Take take a look at Jakarta e, Jakarta e compatibility, and you'll see all of the compatible implementations for Jakarta E8 that you can try out. Um, so next is Jakarta E9 and 9.1, and this is almost done, actually. So it should be done in the next, next uh, few months. Uh, the, as, as we talked about, the primary objective here is to move all of the namespaces from Javax to Jakarta, just like the name has changed. We want to change, all of the, change over all of the packaging as well. Obviously, this is going to have an impact on existing code. Um, the spec itself does not handle that, but a majority of the runtimes will basically, for some period of time, uh, handle uh, allow both the Java and the Jakarta namespace to coexist. So in your application, you won't necessarily break immediately. You can change over all of the all of the all of your namespaces gradually. Okay, as things move along, uh, things like the Spring framework, for example, IntelliJ, uh, they are all uh, adapting to this change to this namespace change as well. Uh, there's some older technologies that are also being removed in, in this process. Why rename uh, older technologies? It doesn't make any sense. 
um, things like uh, JAXRPC and some of the older uh, XML, uh, uh, EJBN, TTBNs, that those do not need to be carried forward. Principally, the objective here is to get, is to allow the ecosystem to absorb this change so that you can build upon and begin iterating over, over it. Uh, there will be a Jakarta 9.1 um, also probably within this year. Uh, so the objective of Jakarta AC 9.1 will be sh shifting from uh, requiring Java SC8 to requiring Java SC11, right? So uh, in Jakarta E 9.1, all of the application servers will say, hey, you need to use Java SC11. You can't just continue using Java SC8 anymore. Uh, the milestone release already is out of Glassfish 6 that implements Jakarta E9 and 9.1. You can begin testing your code and see how the new namespace looks like. Uh, and actually, uh, this change happened with a lot of help from the community. So again, if you're looking to contribute, this is a really good way to contribute. And the Jakarta E ambassadors have written a guide that you can check out. Uh, it's, it's available on, on the Jakarta E ambassadors website. Uh, you can log in and see how you can contribute. Microprofile is another one um, that uh, is important to know that's really very related to ja Jakarta E. So we knew that it's going to take some time for this transfer to happen from Java EE to Jakarta E. So in order to uh, keep the platform moving and give developers uh, relevant features, particularly features relevant to microservices, you needed to do something. And actually, this is where the microprofile uh, a technology set comes into play. So this is also in the Eclipse Foundation. It's very closely related to Java E. It uses a lot of the Java E APIs and builds upon it, but provides microservices specific features, things like distributed tracing, uh, Swagger API doc documentation, type safe REST clients, uh, shared configuration between microservices, doing declarative fault tolerance for microservices, uh, metrics gathering across microservices, uh, security propagation using JWT, doing health checks of your microservices endpoints. Uh, all of these things are actually built into the microprofile uh, API, and um, almost all of the ja Jakarta E runtimes also support them. So you can mix and match uh, microprofile and Jakarta E if you need to. Okay. So now that uh, the transfer is almost done, we need to think about what to do with microprofile. So I've, I've been trying to figure this out myself, uh, and I actually use you know, who, I, I talk to I talk about these issues with whoever I can, uh, and I also take advantage of my Twitter following. Right? So I asked, I put to, put out a poll to figure out, hey, what do people actually want? And uh, actually, most people just want one framework. Right? They don't want microprofile and Jakarta E. They just want one thing called Jakarta E. So uh, the stakeholders are not quite there yet. Right? They don't necessarily agree with these polls. Uh, so if you have an opinion on this, make it known, okay? And say, hey, you know, let's not have two different things. Let's just have one thing. Um, make life simple for everyone. Okay, so looking forward, what is going to be in Jakarta E10? <coughs> so there are a number of things actually that can happen. So one is Jakarta NoSQL. So this is actually an Eclipse Foundation project called Eclipse JNO SQL. <coughs> So the, just like JDBC standardizes access for relational databases, Jakarta NoSQL actually aims to standardize access for NoSQL databases. Right? The NoSQL uh, uh, field is not as dynamic as, as it used to be. There are well-known players. So now is a really good time to begin standardizing some of these things. So one possibility is to include this Jakarta NoSQL standard that is already out there and incorporate it in, into the platform. So you should check out Jakarta NoSQL. It, it's how it, it, you can begin experimenting with it now. Jakarta MBC is another one. So this is an alternative to JSF and that is more action oriented. So it works a little bit better with JavaScript frameworks. Uh, again, it's already out there. You can begin experimenting with it and, and see what you think of it. Right? And, and the possibility is to include that in Jakarta E10. Uh, configuration is another one. So we talked about <coughs> Shared configuration or dynamic configuration outside of the application uh, included in microprofile. It could make sense to put that into Jakarta E10. So begin merging these two things as opposed to having two different things. And configuration is a very good candidate for that. Uh, we already have, as, as you noted, uh, some deprecation of EJB. We could do further deprecate the EJB, EJB 
functionality altogether by translating everything into CDI and putting it in different specifications. So make, make a replacement of message-driven beans uh, in Jakarta messaging, putting things like asynchronous and schedule in concurrency, putting the uh, security annotations in EJB into the security, security uh, API. Uh, in the security API itself, uh, we have support for database and, and LDAP. We could add support for more uh, well-understood security protocols, modern security protocols, like OAuth2, uh, OpenID Connect, uh, JSON Web Token. And so all of these could be built into the standard. And JWT, again, is in the microprofile spec. You know, that, that could be another thing that could make sense to move in into Jakarta instead. Uh, a little bit more Java AC alignment is possible. Um, so one of the specs that uh, could further uh, adopt things like uh, uh, computable features is Jakarta concurrency. Uh, and in case of Jakarta persistence, uh, once you begin adopting Java SE 11, Java SE 11 has records. So you could augment uh, entities with also understanding records in JPA. Okay, so this is another possible, possible change that you can think about. Uh, CDI alignment, uh, there's a bit more of that to be done. So, uh, for example, the batch APIs, some of them cannot be injected. Okay, now the, those could all be injected. Uh, Jakarta REST, as you can see, uses the at context annotations as opposed to CDI annotations. Those could be changed to use, using CDI. Uh, similarly, concurrency uh, can better propagate CDI context. So these are some bits and pieces of changes that can also happen. So uh, we uh, in the Jakarta ambassadors, we've actually created a draft document. I'll show you the draft document a little bit here in a second. That actually uh, puts together a guide of how you can contribute as an end user to Jakarta E10, uh, and basically lists out some features okay, that could potentially be uh, implemented uh, in uh, Jakarta E10. So you should feel free to take a look at this document uh, and begin engaging with the Jakarta E ambassadors. So speaking of the Jakarta ambassadors, um, Jakarta ambassadors do a number of things. Yes, uh, they do things like I'm doing right now, do blogging, speaking, uh, contribute to the specification itself, help other people contribute to the specifications, uh, and so on. And you don't have to be a special person in order to become a Jakarta ambassador. Anyone can become a Jakarta ambassador. You just need to log on onto the onto the website, see how you join up, and see how you begin uh, engaging and begin contributing to something very important to the entire industry, namely Jakarta E as a technology. Um, if there's one thing you can do, you can uh, go ahead and at least start following uh, the Java E ambassador's Twitter handle. A lot of updates will, are usually put out there. So in summary, uh, Jakarta E8 is done, has a ton of good stuff in it, really good good release, really good, for especially for monolithic applications. If you're using microservices, you can combine uh, Jakarta 8 with microprofile, and you still have a very feature complete uh, platform there. Uh, Jakarta E9 and 9.1 are coming soon, okay, uh, followed by Jakarta E10 and beyond. But above that, uh, the main uh, theme that I would encourage you to think about is we move this technology from the JCP to the Eclipse Foundation in order to encourage people to contribute. Okay, so think about getting involved. Think about think about contributing, uh, and we're at the Jakarta e investors. we will be very happy to help you uh, to begin contributing to Jakarta E. So these are some resources I'll leave you with. Uh, the first one is Jakarta One. Uh, the original version of the Jakarta uh, Jakarta One uh, uh, Jakarta One uh, conference actually had talks about the details of a lot of these things that I just covered uh, and more. Right, so feel free to take a look at those. Uh, if there's one place that you want to get involved in, other than the Jakarta E ambassadors, the one uh, place uh, to stay up to date is the Jakarta E community alias, okay, mailing list. So I give you a link to that. Do follow the official handle for Jakarta E. A lot of uh, important thing happens there. Uh, and also consider joining the Jakarta Tech Talks. So a lot of the talks that I'm giving today, there's a space for Jakarta specific talks. Uh, it's available to anyone. It's it's available worldwide. It's on Meetup. Uh, that's another thing that you can subscribe to uh, to stay up to date with Jakarta E as a technology. So that's it. That's all of the uh, things that I have uh, in mind today. Um, I'm, my time is also up, uh, but let me know if you have any questions. Um, you know, uh, if there's no questions, uh, I guess I'll give you some time back.
Uh, Raja, we do have some questions. Uh, sure. Uh, Bala is asking about uh, JSON uh, parsing. So he's asking that uh, how JSON features are introduced are different from JSON jar, JSON dot jar, except the pointer uh, one. I mean, similar to export. So the big difference uh, in the uh, in the features baked into the platform is that it's just there. So as long as you're using a Jakarta E compatible implementation, you don't need any third party jars. Uh, it, it is just there in the platform for you. And it is also integrated into everything. So you don't have to do anything else to integrate uh, anything. So there's no, uh, you don't need to manipulate any jar files or add anything to your Maven dependencies. Uh, and you don't have to configure things with uh, to work with Jakarta REST. So it's a fully integrated platform and it's just there for you. You just uh, do the import in, in your application, begin using the API, that's it. That's the big difference between, in general, between uh, Jakarta and uh, sort of the, these other uh, ways of doing things where you're adding a lot of jars yourself. Nice. Uh, there is an, another question from GC. Um, is some kind of containerization support in being placed in Jakarta EE or micro profile? I'm sorry, uh, what's that? Is some kind of containerization support is placed planned for Jakarta EE and or micro profile? Containerization, okay. Yes. So, yeah, are... there's a, so if you look at the micro profile uh, technologies, a lot of them are actually geared towards Docker and Kubernetes environments. So open tracing, for example, um, it actually implements the open tracing API. So the, what that means is if you are running a microprofile or Jakarta e application with microprofile in it, uh, it will automatically work. Uh, it, it is assuming you're, you're dockerizing and putting your environment in, in Kubernetes because now you can use the Kubernetes, Kubernetes the ecosystem really standardizes on, standardizes on uh, open tracing. Open API similar similar sort of similar sort of assumptions, right? So it's it's a automatically generating Swagger documentation. Whenever you have a REST endpoint, it automatically generates uh, uh, Open API endpoints that you can integrate uh, in a containerized environment. Uh, similar for configuration, right? So you can read environment variables, in, uh, you can read values from within your Docker environment automatically just by doing some doing some configuration. So it's assuming Docker and Kubernetes there as well. Uh, similar for health checks and metrics, you know, those are uh, the the, the um, uh, format that uses is actually something that works natively with uh, Docker and Kubernetes and uh, Prometheus just out of the box. So a lot of it is actually geared towards uh, co containerized in environments to begin with. And also Java EE in general is always, uh, the way Java EE works, it works extremely well with Docker and Kubernetes. The reason is in Java EE, everything is layers. Okay, so uh, you have the app servers layer and then your own um, own application that's, that's put in a distinct layer already. And things like uh, uh, perhaps your own third party uh, uh, database drivers that you want to add to the application server. That is also a separate layer. So if, when you're composing a Java EE uh, a Docker file, you already you meet you automatically have three different layers at least, right? So uh, it also wor that works extremely well in the way that Docker and Kubernetes does deployment. So really, when you make a change, the only change that uh, ultimately uh, the only thing that actually changes in your container is just your code, just the war file deployment just a year, year file deployment and that's it. So Java E actually is already very, very um, friendly in co to containerized environments. Um, and it is actually even uh, more uh, geared towards Docker and Kubernetes environments, uh, uh, thanks to uh, things like MicroProfile, the, all of the MicroProfile features that are built in. There's a lot of talks out there actually on, on how to do, uh, how to deploy MicroProfile features uh, in, in Jakarta E features with Docker and Kubernetes. Um, certainly, it's already a con very container-friendly uh, standard. So we do have another question from GC. Um, what kind of enhancements are being offered by vendors like JBoss, WebSphere, in addition to implementing the spec? 
A number of things. So the most important thing, um, obviously, is uh, what they've always done, right? So things like uh, administrative features, high availability, high ability features, uh, monitoring features, diagnostic features. All of those features are built into the app server. In addition to uh, just implementing the Java E APIs, uh, administrative consoles. Right, that, that's a very ni very nice feature. I've always I always like that particular feature in Java E. Um, and also enhancement in things in addition to what the standard offers, right? So Hibernate will offer some features above and beyond JPA. Uh, Jersey will offer some features above and beyond what, what Jakarta REST will offer. Uh, Mohara will have some proprietary features in addition to what, what JSF will have. So there's always the extensions, points like that. Um, security is a good example, right? So majority of the application servers already support JWT open ID connect in a, in a proprietary way, although uh, in Jakarta security, it does not standardize yet. So there's always things uh, beyond the standard that typically will be brought into uh, the standards. So in fact, a majority of the things uh, that are in, in this document um, that are ideas for Jakarta E10, a lot of those are nothing much more than um, things that are available in the app servers already in proprietary ways, but adding support for them in, in the standard. So one example would be, uh, let's take a look, uh, transactions. Some of the things that are in transactions, all of these are available in, in, um, in app server specific ways. And you can uh, basically make them not app server specific by including including them in the standard. So take a look at that document. There's a number of examples of that. Another very good example is modularity, right? So uh, although Java E does not define modularity, if you look at Open Liberty um, or if you look at JBoss, or uh, uh, they, they will all they'll allow you, or even things like Quarkus, for example, that are microfile based they will allow features above and beyond like uh, modularizing the platform. So only taking bits and pieces of the platform that you need uh, to further minimize your container size. Open Liberty and uh, Webster Liberty is a particularly good example of that. Uh, doing dynamic, dynamic loading of modules to, uh, to uh, reduce memory. That's uh, always memory optimization and runtime optimizations are, are, are an important capability for app servers as well. If you things like look at things like Quarkus, they are uh, going uh, um, uh, beyond the standard by uh, at, uh, allowing for native compilation uh, with Graal VM. So there's all kinds of runtime features. It may not be necessarily API features, but the way the runtime works, Java e runtimes works outside of the API, that is always evolving and um, you know always going to be. Uh, not always, but you know, often it is container specific, implementation specific, rather than defined in the API. Uh, yes, uh, we have another question related to modularization. Uh, can JPMS Java platform module system be used in Java applications? Uh, yes yeah. and no. Right. So this is an area of exploration um, for Java EE ten. So the problem with JPMS is that it is very limited. Right? So uh, JPMS is good for uh, the purpose that it was being used for right now, which is modularizing the JDK itself. Right? So, and a lot of people aren't really using even that. Right? So uh, I don't know how many people even know that you can have different modules of the JDK. You can download a minimal module and then add, you know, using JPMS, add the modules that you need. Uh, so, it, Basically, JPMS is too limited, right? So if you look at, uh, for example, Open Liberty, uh, it uses something much more powerful. It uses OSGI to do modularization. Uh, Glassfish, same thing. It, it uses Felix uh, and uh, uh, OSGI as an underlying modularization mechanism. Same thing with JBoss application server. It is using uh, JBoss modules that is much more has much more capabilities like dynamic loading and unloading. Uh, a lot of ex more extended metadata that allows for things like uh, multiple versioning of the same jars. Uh, a lot of those things are just not in JPMS yet. Um, so my guess is that when um, the JPMS um, standard will have to evolve much more before Java E can use it in a meaningful way. Right now, it's it's too limited. 
But what is happening is that uh, uh, some specifications, like JPA, for example, define JPMS modules. Right. So if you ha do happen to be using JPMS somehow, right, the few people that are adopting it, the adoption um, rate for JPMS is still very, very low. Uh, but you can take basically Hibernate and use it as a JPMS module. Um, that's it for now, uh, Rajab. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your, you guys having me. Um, hopefully, I get to come back here and talk to you about something else at some other point in time. Other than that, have a good evening. Stay safe. Uh, and uh, hopefully, maybe see you soon. Thank you very much, Raja. It's a nice presentation that we got to know many features about Jakarta EE from 9 and 10, the uh, future things also. The, uh, it's very good to have this presentation. And uh, thank you very much, guys, uh, for being uh, attend for being part of Kotlin Hyderabad community and uh, attending today's session. So we are open uh, if you want to give any presentation on Kotlin, Java, or any JVM related things. Details uh, to contact us are, are in the below description. Thank you very much for again for joining us. Bye bye.